make a start. Um, I'll continue um, with what we were talking about this morning. Um, it was the question of rules and the question of regularities and so on within the, uh, within the language, within the grammar. Um, so to recapitulate, um, the standard view, as I explained, was that knowing a language was to know a, a list of words, a set of words, and a set of rules for combining the words. So the grammar, the dictionary plus the grammar. Um, that turns out to be actually very problematic. And it's problematic essentially because of um, idioms, the existence of idioms and idiomatic expressions, expressions which, are not, which cannot be produced by the, the rules operating over the list of words. And when you start looking at the idiomatic, it turns out that an awful lot in a language actually is idiomatic in this sense. Um, this actually has interesting consequences for learning the language. Learning the language is not learning a list of words plus rules. In fact, it becomes a matter of learning a very large number of these idioms, if you like. Um, thousands of them. Tens of thousands of them, perhaps. That's why it takes so long to learn a language, basically. Uh, and why it needs enormous exposure to real language data. Um, the exposure you get from listening, from reading, and, and so on and so forth. But it takes a long time, an awful lot of exposure for you to be able to build up this set of well, I'm calling them idioms, but the idiomatic actually um, is a very broad notion. It ranges on the, one, on the one hand from these obviously idiomatic things like kick the bucket um, to constructional idioms, which we talked about, um, which have, which can be a topic that I introduced right at the beginning, Lanaka's definition of a language or a grammar of a language. Grammar here is in the very general sense of you know, the whole language, not just the syntax, but also the words and the phonology, the pronunciation, everything. <coughs> so the grammar of a language can be defined, or is defined, as those aspects of cognitive organization in which resides a speaker's grasp of established linguistic convention. It can be characterized as a structured inventory of conventional linguistic units. Now, the conventional linguistic units, well, those are things like pronunciations, meanings, word well, words, word combinations, constructional idioms, etc., etc. Now, according to this, this is repeating what I did yesterday, it follows from this that there are basically only three kinds of objects in the language, the phonological structures, that is, pronunciation, patterns, sounds, syllables, uh, and so on, pronunciations, semantic structures, that is, if you like, meanings, and symbolic structures which relate one and two. So to know a language is to know many tens, hundreds of thousands of these units, and to learn a language is to gradually build up this structured inventory. An inventory, by the way, is simply a list. Okay. But it's not just a, any old list. The list is structured. And that's the point I want to emphasize and want to go into uh, this afternoon. Um, the, the inventory, the list of things in the language is structured. It is not just some random, any old collection of units. And uh, some of the relations that can structure, you, that, that can structure the language um, again, this is repeating what we did yesterday. One unit can be a part of a large unit. This is the part-whole relation. One unit can be schematic for another unit, which is an instance of the schema, and one unit can resemble another unit. And any particular expression usually has all sorts of relations to all sorts of other things in the language. And that basically is what I want to talk about this afternoon, or I'll get on to talking about that this afternoon. Now, uh, okay, um, some clarification of the notion of the schema. 
Um, say one unit can be schematic for another unit, which is an instance of the schema. Um, a, schematic, a schema is a unit which captures what is common amongst a range of instances. Each instance elaborates the schema in different ways. And the example of a schema would be what I had this morning, what is X doing Y? So what's X doing Y? Um, which is schematic in that X and Y can be filled in with all sorts of other things. So what's X doing Y is schematic for the whole set of expressions which instantiate, which conform to the schema. So the schema is fairly abstract. The instances would be, you know, what are you doing lying on the floor? What's this book doing on the table? What's the fly doing in the soup, etc.? So these would be the instances, and the schema is the generalization. But of course, the schema, what, what is X doing Y, of course, is complex. It has parts, parts being what is, the verb to do, and so on. Right, um, now, one important, okay, in, in, in cognitive linguistics, schemas capture generalizations over instances, and they are, in fact, the equivalent of rules. They are, the, they are rules, if you like. Um, although I put, the, I put rule in inverted commas, because the notion of rule is, in fact, a very, difficult, is in fact a very tricky one. It's, um, for example, if you think of other kinds of rules, rules which you have in other areas of experience. You would have the rules of a game, right? To play chess, you have to follow the rules. The rules define the game. If you play chess and you don't obey the rules, well, in fact, you're not playing chess. Uh, the rules define the game. And there would be, and the notion of an exception to the rule, actually, Um, the, the idea of an exception to a rule in chess would not actually count. It, it, it's an incoherent notion. Because if you don't follow the rule, you're not playing the game. Right? Okay, so you have rules which actually define something. Then you have, for example, the traffic rules. You must drive on the right side of the road or on the left side of the road. Um, that is quite different, in fact, from the rule in a, in a game of chess, the rule simply says, this is what you should do, this is what, what we want you to do. If you don't, then there are consequences. Um, now, the rules of language are not like that. It's not that this is the rule, you must follow it. If you don't, well, then you get punished or something. It doesn't work like that. Um, and likewise, uh, the rules of grammar are not like the rules of chess, uh, because you can break them. There are exceptions. Uh, another use of the word rule would be for something like the, uh, a scientific, well, not rule, a scientific law. If you drop something, gravity operates on it. Um, that has no exceptions, because it would mean that the laws of physics would be different. Right? And again, rules of language are not like this. So one of the questions I'm looking at, in fact, is what are these rules in language? And perhaps rule is not quite the right word. I prefer simply schemas and generalizations over the data. Um, now, one important point here is that the existence of a schema to know the generalization does not mean that the knowledge of the instances is erased. Okay. But if you see what I mean by that. Okay, so you, in learning English, you encounter expressions like, you, you hear somebody say, what's that book doing on the table? And then you hear somebody else say, what are you doing lying on the floor? And then you hear the joke about, what's the fly doing in my soup? So you hear these expressions, and then you notice that they are similar, and then you form the schema unconsciously, of course, but the fact that you have formed the schema does not mean that you have forgotten the examples on which the schema is based. So knowledge of the schema, of the, if you like, the rule of the generalization, of the abstraction, can exist at the same time as knowledge of the examples. So this makes the network, in fact, the network of units very complicated and very dense. Right? 
Now, I want to illustrate that on, on a very, very simple example, but the, the example is actually rather instructive. Um, perhaps one of the, if you like, the simplest rules in English, uh, the rule of morphology, is how do you make a noun plural? Okay, well, first of all, you don't make all nouns plural. It's the so-called count nouns, but we'll forget that in a moment. How do you make a noun plural? Well, it could hardly be simpler. You simply add an S. Okay? So, you learn English, uh, and you encounter examples like one dog, two dogs, one cat, two cats, a hand, your hands, a table, the tables, and you encounter dozens, hundreds of these examples, and then finally you realize that there's a regularity. Namely, there's a schema for a plural noun, which is the noun stem plus s, either s, z, or z, as the case may be. So um, you then learn the schema for the plural noun. Now, this does not mean that once you know how to make a noun plural, that you forget the plural nouns. Um, to put it another way, if you use the word hands, my hands, um, are you in fact creating that form by applying the rule, one hand, two hands? Are you in fact adding an S? Or are you simply using something that you've already learned? Okay? Um, and how could we know? Um, well, in fact, it is, there has been some experiments on this, actually, um, which I can perhaps briefly discuss. Um, how do you know, how can we find out whether English speakers actually store in their memories both the singular I and the plural eyes, or whether when you use the word eyes, you are in fact taking the form I and adding an S on the end, if you see the problem. Okay. How can you find that out? Well, um, the, 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 there is an experimental um, technique for doing this. It's been uh, a technique used by psycholinguists, people who use a psychologi um, no, psychologists of language, to investigate this problem. And I'll perhaps uh, ex go through very briefly um, the kind of evidence suggesting that people do, in fact, store plurals if the plural form is frequent. If the plural form occurs frequently, more frequently than the singular form, there's evidence that the plural form is, in fact, remembered separately, or in, as well as the singular form. Now, the experiment, the, the technique used, um, is... Um, I don't know whether you... Um, it's a technique called the lexical decision task. And the experiment is very simple. You lo you're looking at a screen, and then a series of letters comes on the screen. It might be difficult with a language like Chinese, but never mind. Uh, a series of letters comes on the screen, then you must say as quickly as possible if that is a word or not a word. So you must decide whether it is a lexical item or not. So, for example, you might have the word I comes on the screen and you press your two buttons, yes, no, as quickly as you can. And you can usually make the decision in less than a second, obviously. Something else comes on the screen. Um, so... If that comes on the screen, then, of course, you say, no, it is not a word. And, of course, half the examples are words, half the examples are not words, so you have to pay attention. Okay, now, the, it's, a, it's a very simple sort of experiment. And the crucial factor is, of course, how long it takes somebody to decide whether something is a word or not. Um, and it happens very quickly, and the measurements are, say, the time involved is less than one second. Okay? So it happens very quickly. And, it's, and one of the things that determines how quickly you can decide whether something is a word or not is, first of all, how long it is. 
which is not surprising. The longer the string of letters, the longer it takes you to decide that it is a word. It takes longer to read. So three-letter things like that are very, can be decided very quickly. Ten letters takes much longer. So how long the string of letters is, is one factor. The other factor is um, how frequent the word is in the language. Um, so, for example, if you take another three-letter word, that is a female sheep, you, a female sheep, not a very common word. So given those two, that would be easier to recognize as a word than that. It would take longer to decide that that is a word than to decide that that is a word, because this is more frequent than that, more frequent in the language. Um, now, I think you'll see how you can use this technique to decide whether people remember singulars and plurals separately or whether they remember simply the singulars. You take words which occur predominantly in the singular and words which, compare, which, uh, which occur predominantly in the plural. Examples would be of a high singular noun um, uh, that is a word which occurs quite often in the singular. A high plural noun would be okay. So island, islands, error, errors. Um, you can get the frequency by looking at a corpus, for example. So. This one occurs in the plural more often than that one occurs in the plural. So you do your lexical decision thing, and the crucial question is, is there a difference between recognizing the singular and the plural as a word? And it's found that for words which have high-frequency plurals, the plurals are in fact easy to recognize, but the words with low-frequency plurals, then the plurals take longer. Right? So that is a sort of evidence that people do, in fact, store the plurals. In other words, you, st you store the output of the rule. Right? It's, not, it's not the question of whether you know or have the rule, but the idea, well, the standard view would be, okay, you have the rule, you make the singular, you add the S, and you make the plural. So the plural is the output, the result of applying the rule. But it seems that people actually remember, store, the output of the rule as well as the rule itself. See what I mean? And what they store, what you remember, is dependent on how frequently it occurs in the language. So frequency, frequency of occurrence is actually a very, very important notion. And frequency... Um, in cognitive linguistics or cognitive grammar that is often referred to as a degree of entrenchment of form. Something is entrenched, it's sort of deeply ingrained in your mind because you've used it or heard it a large number of times. So frequently occurring expressions are, if you like, learnt more <laughs> than rare expressions. Okay, now that is a fairly straightforward, actually. And, it's, um, and this can be illustrated, as I say, quite nicely on the examples of plurals. But let's go on now and look at what exactly some of the differences would be between the cognitive linguistic account of rules and applying rules and the traditional view. Uh, now, um, Still keeping to the question of plurals. Now, the plural in English is a, is a nice illustration of this because the rule is pretty, pretty simple. You could hardly imagine a simpler rule in the language. Um, it simply says add an S. Now, there was um, a study conducted in 1958, a long time ago, by Jean Burko, and it's a study which is cited, quoted, referred to very, very often. And what she did, she wanted to find out whether children learning English, whether they have the rule to make nouns plural. 
So how can you find out whether children have the rule? Um, well, she argued that you couldn't, it, it's not sufficient to say whether they know whether, that the plural of dog is dogs, because perhaps they've encountered, they've come across the word dog, they've come across the word dogs, they've learned both of them, and if they say one dog, two dogs, perhaps they're simply repeating what they've learned by heart. That is not evidence that they are actually, that they have the rule and are applying the rule. They might be simply, you know, retrieving some form from memory. So to get around this problem, she used nonsense words, right? Words which actually don't exist in the language and which therefore the children have never encountered. And um, the well-known example, of course, is the wug. Have you heard of wugs? Anyway, she showed the, the, the children um, a picture of a sort of bird-like thing and said, well, this is a wug. Wug is not an English word. They, the children would never have heard it before. They said, look, this is a wug. What is it? It's a wug. And then, hey, look, there's three of them. Showing another picture. There are three of them. What are they? And, of course, the, the, the interview with the child was set up in such a way as to make the child say, wugs with the S on. And once the child said wugs, that would be evidence that the child has the rule, can apply the rule to a nonsense word. Okay? Now, that, so the aim of this study <coughs> was to find out whether children are able to apply the rules, the linguists' rules, the rules that linguists propose in their speech. So she had these nonsense words. Now, the um, results of this experiment actually are rather interesting. Let's see if this works. Um, okay. First of all, she started out with, with a real word, glass, and one glass, several glasses. And there were um, two groups of children, preschoolers, uh, they were at four, three to four years old, and first grade is about six, six or seven. Okay, now glass was put in um, as a kind of control. Um, glass is a word that the children would know, and they produced, as you see, 75% of the preschoolers, almost all, just about all of the first graders, produced the correct form glasses. And a reasonable assumption there would be, well, they've heard the form glasses, they've learned the plural. But now look at the, uh, what happens to the nonsense words. First of all, wug. Um, preschoolers, about three quarters had it, and when you get to the six, seven-year-olds, just about, they all had it. They all knew how to make the plural, without mistake. And then, as you go through the examples, lun, luns, tor, tors, heef, heaves, heef, heefs, heaves, cra, cras. And then, okay, no, 79, it's about, you know, just about all of them got it. Even, well, six or seven year old, and even, the, and even the young ones had it. But then you get the last four. Tass, Gutch, Cash, and Niz, as nonsense words. Notice that with Tass, even the six and seven year olds, most of them didn't get it. And with Niz, again, most of them didn't, didn't get it. And with, with, with Niz, yeah, only, only about a quarter of these kids got it. Which is, if you think about it, that is actually quite remarkable. The rule could hardly be simpler. Right? Um, it's a rule which has very few exceptions, although the, well, I'll, come back, I'll come to the exceptions in a moment. So it's a very, the rule could hardly be simpler. Um, if there is a rule that applies more or less across the board to everything, then this is it. Uh, but you find that even six or seven-year-olds, kids already at school, um, couldn't make the plurals of these nouns. Um, okay, you may be asking what did they do then if they couldn't make the plural. Well, what they did, they simply um, didn't do anything. One niz, two niz. One tass, two tass. One gutch, 
several guts. They just didn't add anything. Um, so, what was going on? How to account for this? Um, so, uh, even six or seven year olds performed poorly on the nonsense words TAS and NIS and so on, and their response was simply one TAS, two TAS. And Berko responds, Berko writes in her article that some of these children were actually very confident. One TAS, two TAS, no doubt about it. They were very confident about this. <clears throat> okay, so what was going on? One possibility for this, for the high error rate, even for these no, six, seven-year-olds, which is quite old for language acquisition. One possibility is that TAS and NIS, although they're not English words, they sort of look plural, or rather they sound plural, because they end in a sort of S sound. So TAS, and, so the plural ending is a S, Z, and if you have a word which ends in S, Z, it already sort of sounds plural. Therefore, well, that is the plural. So the idea would be that with a word like niz, well, that, that can count as a plural because it ends in the right kind of sound. Okay? Um, so this then gives a different perspective on what these kids were doing when they were forming the plural, when, our, when asked to make the plural, they were not, in fact, adding the plural ending according to the rule. What they were doing, rather, was that they were simply producing something which conformed with the schema for a plural noun. And the schema for a plural noun says something s, z at the end. Something ending in s, z, or z is a plural. That's what the plural schema says. So it seems that what they were doing, they were simply producing a form which conformed with the schema. Okay? That actually gives a rather different perspective on the rule. I put at the top of the rule, so I get back to the, sorry, um, that the rule is product oriented. The rule defines the output. Right? The rule states what you get at the end rather than the input and what you do to it. So the rule states what the what the end point is, what the goal is. How you get there is your business, basically. Um, so the emphasis then is on getting a form, getting something which conforms with the schema for the output. Um, um, interestingly, That actually applies to some extent also um, for the past tense forms. Now, the, the, to make a verb past tense, the standard rule is, of course, add ed, or whatever. And there are the whole set of strong verbs where you don't, and go, went, run, ran, and so on. Um, but there's also a very small group of verbs where you don't actually do anything, where the past is the same as the present. Okay? Such as put, I put, he puts, he put. Um, so a small group of verbs which are the same in the present and the past tense. And what do you notice about those verbs? Put, set, any others? Um, let? There's about, about half a dozen of them. Um, what is characteristic of these verbs is that they all end in a T. And T, of course, is the characteristic sound for the past tense. Walk, walked. So if a, if a, if a noun, um, so if, if, a, if a verb already ends in a T, then, you know, it can count as a past tense, because it ends in a typical past tense sound. Um, Fit is another one. Um, it, it fits into something. It, it. Um, of course, not every verb ending in a t 
as um, this irregular past tense, but all the verbs which are the same in the present and the past, they end in a T. I think there's maybe one or two ending in a D as well, but never mind. But there you see the same kind of thing in operation. The past tense rule at ED, well, yes, that's true, but the rule also specifies that the past tense has to end in a T or a D, of, of the weak verbs anyway. Another more complicated case here on the irregular past tenses, let's just look at these. Um, this is, when, when you look at the past tense forms in English, of course the majority of English verbs are regular, they end in ed, but there's about a hundred verbs actually which are irregular in some, in some way. Um, and these irregulars, they form little subgroups, little patterns of regularity. An interesting case is this, the dwell, dwelt, um, bend, bent, then lent, sleep, slept, deal, dealt, leave, left, smell, smelt, feel, felt, keep, kept, sweep, swept, dream, dreamt, and cleave, cleft. Okay, th those are... Okay, what you notice with these, what are, you've got 12 verbs here, there are probably a couple more as well. What you notice about these is that the past tense forms are, are, are similar. They all, have, they, they all have the short e vowel. They all have the short e vowel. They then have a consonant after the e, and they end in a t. So the past tense form, in fact, you can actually do a schema for this. The schema is uh, you have a vowel, sorry, um, you have an e vowel. You have a consonant and you have a T at the end. And it doesn't matter what comes first. Um, so that is a sort of so the short E vowel, a consonant, and a final T. That is a kind of schema for these past tense forms. Now how you get the past how do you how you get to this past tense form? is different in different cases. For dwell, well, the regular form, if you apply the rule, the regular form of dwell, past tense, would be dwelled, of course. It would be voiced. So this involves devoicing the final L. So dwell, dwelled, so dwelt. And again, bend. Notice with bend, you actually change the final consonant to make it conform to this. The regular form would be, would be bended, and simply, uh, similarly, lend, lent. Smell, smell to the same as dwell. Feel, well, what you do with feel, you add the T, but then you make the vowel short, because that's what the schema says. So feel rather than field, or field becomes felt. Um, dream, dreamt, clee, or leave, left is a nice one, um, because you're doing three things there. You're adding the final T. The V at the end of leave becomes an F by voicing assimilation. And the vowel E becomes an E. So if you were to write rules to say exactly what was happening in all these cases, you would, in fact, have three or four different rules. The, the different kinds of things you do to the, to the present tense to get past tense. Sometimes you simply add a T, sometimes you replace a D by a T, sometimes the E vowel becomes an E vowel, um, sometimes the, the you have a voice change, leave becoming left, and so on. So, different rules for all cases. But in fact, if you look at the things there, you'll see it's very, very, very simple. Well, what seems to be happening is that you take the present tense form, the, pre the present form, and then you do something in order to get that. So the aim is to produce something which conforms with the output schema. What you do can be different in different cases, if you follow that. Okay. Okay, now, coming back to the plural forms. Now, um, 
there probably is no such thing as a rule which has no exceptions. Um, of course, even the very simple plural rule in, in English has exceptions. There are men, women, children, oxen, aircraft, which is the same in singular and plural. Um, then some of the exceptions show a kind of limited regularity. So there's rules within rules, so to speak. So you have the houses, leaves, wives, roofs. What happens here is that you add the z at the end, but the final consonant vosses. One house, two houses, roof. Uh, le leaf, as a leaf of a tree, leaf, leaves, wife, wives, roof, roofs. Okay, so the final consonant voices. Then you have the, the words like thesis, thesis, theses. So the cis becomes sees. Thesis, theses, hypothesis, hypotheses, crisis, crises, axis, axes, basis, bases and so on. So, um, and this particular case of the, 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 the thesis group, um, you can see the regularity. The singular ends in cis, unstressed cis. The plural ends in cis. Okay? So, if you have a word like thesis and you want to make it plural, what do you do? Well, there are basically two rules, two schemas which are sort of competing. One rule says, well, well I suppose one rule says you, you add the ES kind of thing, giving you theses, but then on the other hand, there are too many S's there. If it ends in an S, it's already plural. But then there's this specific schema which says, Words ending in cis go to cs. So there are certain conflicts. Um, so which of these various schemas, rules, if you like, wins out when they are competing? Now, in general, it would seem, a general principle is that the more specific schema, the schema which has more information in it, right? The, 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 the schema which is less schematic, if you like, the schema which has more specific information, wins out over the more general one. And there is, in fact, here a very general cognitive principle uh, which has been invoked in many contexts. Specific information overrides general information. Right? Specific information overrides, cancels out general information. Okay? Um, so an illustration of that would be, well, birds fly, except when they don't, if you see what I mean. So if you learn that something is a bird, the general rule would be, if it's a bird, it flies. But you know that penguins don't fly. This is specific knowledge about penguins, and the specific knowledge then overrides the general knowledge. Right? So the specific knowledge that you have about penguins, the fact that they don't fly, um, um, takes precedence over the general knowledge that birds fly. So specific knowledge is able to override, becomes more important, cancels out general knowledge. So the specific schema for words like thesis, theses, overrides the general schema for adding ES. Basically what happens here, I think, is because man and men are both very frequent words, and the plural is very frequent, your knowledge of the plural, in fact, overrides everything else. So the exception, in fact, becomes a rule for itself. So irregulars, things like men, man, men, may be entrenched through frequent use, and in effect the exception becomes its own rule. Right? The, the, your knowledge of the exception overrides um, any other particular rules. Um, now, frequency is actually involved here, as I, as I mentioned. Let's look at the other group, the, the other kind of irregulars, words like roof, roofs, um, leaf, leaves, wife, wives. Um, 
Okay, you have leaf, leaves, life, lives, wife, wives. These, I think, are pretty standard in English. However, if you have a word like roof, the roof of a house, um, I think quite a few English speakers actually vary between roofs and roofs. I guess the standard reference grammars would say roofs, but lots of people actually say roofs. And when you get to hoof, hooves, um, you know what a hoof is? It's the thing of the, the horse's leg. Uh, the horse hooves at the bottom of his legs where you put the shoe on. That's, um, so, hoof, hooves. But nowadays I think people would say hoofs. And the reason for that is fairly obvious, um, fairly clear, I would think. Um, nowadays, we just don't talk about horses' hooves because horses are not part of our lives anymore. Uh, in old days, when horses were essential for transport and for agriculture and so on, um, you know, putting on horse, putting on horse shoes was you know, a very important activity. So there were, there were lots of occasions to talk about the feet of horses, Horses' hooves. Um, so the word hoof, who, hooves would be in quite frequent use. And the frequency with which it was used would then entrench the form so that you know, the irregular form survived and persisted. But nowadays, when you don't talk about horses' hooves anymore, um, if you had to make the word plural, then probably you would use the, 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 the general pattern, hoofs, because the specific schema, it just isn't strong enough. Right? Um, and if you look at the word leaf leaves, well, the leaves of a tree, well, I would imagine this is one of those words which you use predominantly in the plural. Uh, because leaves come in large numbers. So, if you're talking about these things on a tree, normally you would talk about them in the plural, and so on. <coughs> <coughs> and sometimes you can actually observe uncertainty. What's the plural of oasis? Which is a nice one. I've tested this out on people and you get different responses. First of all, oasis, you know, the water in the desert. Right? Um, it's not a very common word. <coughs> um, and it's the kind of word that you would hardly ever use in the plural. Okay? There aren't many occasions to talk about an oasis and even fewer occasions to talk about several of them. So, if you had to form the plural of oasis, you have a sort of problem. You haven't heard it before. It ends in cis, so perhaps it's like thesis, but perhaps it isn't. Um, um, so there's a certain sort of uncertainty, but, but you're not quite sure. So, what you find here is that there is a, a actually quite a lot of uncertainty. Some people would say, oh, oasises. Others would say oases. Um, but basically they don't know. So what you see here is in fact two schemas competing. Right? On the one hand you want to make it regular because most nouns are regular ending in cis. On the other hand it ends in an S, so perhaps the thesis, thesis rule applies. But basically people don't know. An interesting one I've noticed is the word process, a process. Um, what's the plural of process? You have several... Well, you would say processes, yes. I, that's what I would have said. Uh, one process, two processes. But there's a problem. It ends in all those S's. And what you hear very often is what for me is a very strange form, processes processes, especially by North Americans, processes. One process, several processes. In other words, it's a funny mixture of the regular adding cis, adding es, and the thesis plural, where you end in es, so process, processes. It's written the same way, but the pronunciation you often hear is processes, which is very peculiar to me anyway. Okay, um, How's the time? Okay, that's an illustration then of how... Um, <laughs> sorry? Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, I was talking about that without the...
thing there. Okay, they were the, I should have shouted out at me, um, the irregulars, hoofs and roofs and so on. Okay, so that's an example then of how you can understand rules within the notion of the schema. Now, what I want to do next is to um, address the question of, or illustrate the notion of the structured nature of language knowledge, the way in which things relate to other things. And I want to take the example of the hamburger, which is a nice example, the hamburger, which we all know. Um, now, if you look up hamburger in the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the historical dictionary, which records the previous uses, the, you know, the history of the word, it would seem that the word hamburger was used in English, American English, towards the end of the 19th century and referred to a hamburger steak. And clearly it was derived from Hamburg, the German city, and it was something, I presume, used by the German immigrants to refer to their speciality, which was a steak which was made of mincemeat. Not a real steak, but a mince, no, mincemeat and flattened out and fried. So a hamburger steak, a steak associated with the city of Hamburg. But as we all know, hamburger became reanalyzed. Not Hamburg plus er, but ham plus burger. In other words, burger became a word. Um, and the ER on the end of Hamburg, Hamburger, that is the ER which is associated with a place. So London, Londoner, um, Island, Islander, and so on. So um, the question then, what, so Hamburger was Hamburg Air, but then it obviously became Hamburger. How and why? Notice that hamburgers are, have nothing to do with ham. They're not made of ham, they're made of beef. Right? Although ham is, well, it's kind of meat, I suppose, but there's no ham in a hamburger. And clearly, burger was not a word when this first happened. Um, so, what caused that to happen? Let's take another example. Take the word meat, M-E-A-T. <clears throat> Why don't you analyze that as eat with an M in front? Why don't you see a morpheme in the word meat, namely the morpheme eat? Because after all, meat is something that you eat. Right? It's logical. <clears throat> And why don't you analyze here as containing the morpheme ear? Because hearing you do with your ears. Right? So why don't you analyze the word here as ear with an H in front and recognize the H and the M as morphemes? <clears throat> of course, this would lead you with a cranberry morpheme, which we had this morning, namely the H, the M, and the H. These, are, these will be morphemes which exist only in these single words. But cranberry morphemes are quite normal. If you take the word Tuesday, I think you can quite easily recognize day at the end. Tuesday contains the morpheme day. Right? But then what do you do with the choose at the beginning? Which is not a morpheme. Or you take the word butcher you see the ER on the end, which is a typical morpheme for a profession, somebody who does something. You have baker, singer, painter, writer. Um, so singer, one who sings, dancer, one who dances. Um, the butcher, one who butches. The point is there is no verb to butch. To butch is not a verb. So a butcher it's the name of a profession, somebody who does something. The ER on the end is a typical morpheme for a profession, for an activity. But then you're left with this butch at the beginning, which is not a morpheme. Well, it is a morpheme, but it occurs only in that one word. 
So cranberry morphemes like this are everywhere, in fact, they're quite common. So to analyze meat as eat plus M, uh, the fact that M is not a morpheme anywhere else, there's actually no argument for this. The real reason, as I explained at the bottom, is that there is, in fact, in English, no general pattern for deriving words by adding a consonant at the beginning of something. In English, you derive words by adding things at the end, you know, dance, dancer, London, Londoner. Um, but the way English is structured, you don't derive words by putting a consonant at the beginning. It's just not English. There is no general pattern in English for deriving words, for making words, by putting a consonant at the beginning. So although it would make semantic sense, you can see the connection between meat and eat, this would not be possible because basically there is no schema for it. There is no pattern in the language for doing this. There is no schema of which m, eat, would be an instance. So, coming back to the hamburger, and here my phonetic symbols have gone funny. <coughs> How could hamburger have been analyzed as hamburger? Well, one, the reason I suspect is because of the pronunciation. And here I'll, these strange <laughs> symbols, pronunciation, like that hamburger. That's what that thing is supposed to be. If I put in the stress marks, you are familiar with all the symbols. There's a hamburger, main stress, secondary stress, hamburger. This is a long vowel hamburger. Um, the, str the stress pattern of this is characteristic of a compound noun, like dog lover, meat eater, bus station, hand signal, housewife, airport, and hundreds more. So it has the stress pattern of a compound noun, like bus station, ham, burger. Um, so it conforms with, with a general sort of schema for compound nouns. And because, and because of its pronunciation, the stress pattern, <coughs> and um, because of this, it then sort of becomes possible to sort of analyze it as a sort of compound noun, like house, wife, bus, station, airport, um, hand signal, and so on. Um, now, once you've done that, then, of course, that can emerge as a separate word, which indeed, which indeed it has. Um, and your hamburgers, cheeseburgers, and all the rest of them. Okay, um, so that's actually a very simple example of how you know, the, the relations within the language actually caused that to be analyzed as it did. Another example <coughs> of how things in the language are structured, that a language, as I say, is not just a set of random items, but they're all sort of related. Uh, this is a very common phenomenon uh, in connection with prepositions. Um, if you look at the examples here, he ran round the corner and he lives round the corner, you will see that round the corner means something different in the two cases. Um, I could illustrate that. Okay, um, that is a sort of building. And if you run round the corner, you start here and you run like that. Okay, you run round the corner. <coughs> so round the corner refers to the path of the runner. Okay? Now, if you say he lives round the corner, what you mean is that, okay, there is the building, 
he lives there, but there's a kind of imaginary, that's an eye, <laughs> you're looking at the scene from here, there's an imaginary observer, we are here and he lives there. In other words, to get to his place you have to go round the corner from somewhere. Okay? <clears throat> And you can actually make that explicit in English. He lives round the corner from me. I live here, he lives there. Or he lives round the corner from here. We are here, he lives there. <coughs> so that would be a case of the polysemy of round, or rather round the corner. It can refer here to the path. Okay? And here it is the end point of an imaginary path. Right? An imaginary path from somewhere like that. So the, <coughs> so the thing is polysimus. Polysimus, it has two meanings. Now, um, <coughs> one might say, as I put here, that the polysemy of this expression has a very good conceptual motivation. Basically, it's a case of um, metonymy. Metonymy, um, here you're referring to the end, po so here you're referring to the path, the whole path, here it's simply the end point of a path. You are referring to a part of something. Okay. So there's a clear sort of conceptual relatedness between those two. Um, does that work in Chinese like that? To go around the corner and to live around the corner? Okay. Now, the point I want to make is that this works in English not only because it sort of makes conceptual sense, you can actually see the similarity, but it works because it's a very general phenomenon in the language. In general, a preposition which can designate a path, you know, of where you go, can also designate the end point of a path. <coughs> and here are some examples. Um, walk down the street, so walk down the street is the activity, but he lives down the street. He lives at a place which is, you know, at the end point of the path down the street. You walk over the hill, but he lives over the hill. We are here, there's the hill, he lives there. He lives over the hill. To get to his place, you have to go over the hill. You walk through the kitchen, but the pantry is through the kitchen. Um, you drive past the post office. Here's the post office. Drive past it. Um, but the police station is past the post office. So the police station is at the end of a path which goes past the post office. So it's very general. Um, in other words, there's a schema uh, which says that um, path prepositions can be used in the, to refer to the end point of a path, not just the path itself. Um, not all of them, however. There are a few exceptions. Via is an interesting one. You go to one place via something else. I flew to Beijing via Singapore, but I cannot say Beijing is via Singapore. It doesn't work. I drove my car into the wall, Right? But I cannot say my car is now into the wall. Doesn't work. You throw rocks at the police, but you cannot say the rocks are now at the police. Doesn't work. So there's a certain limitation on the, product, on the productivity of that. Um, and this is further related to a peculiar fact about English, which I think I'll be talking about tomorrow in more detail, 
This is to do with the fact that in English the prepositions actually carry a lot of information. Prepositions can designate the path of motion. Um, things like to limp across the road. You know, to limp is sort of like that. To limp across the road, jump out of bed, swim into the cave, roll down the hill. Um, in other words, what happens in the things like limp across the road, limp refers to a way of moving with a, you know, a leg which doesn't function very well. Uh, so limp refers simply to a way of moving, but across the road designates where you go. So the path is expressed by the preposition, and the verb expresses how you do it. Um, Does that work in Chinese like that? People say it does. Now, it doesn't work in all languages. Um, in other kinds of languages, you cannot say, I limped across the road. You have to say, I crossed the road limping. You cannot say, I jumped out of bed, but I went out of bed with a jump. Or, I swam into the cave, you have to say, I entered the cave swimming. And I rolled down the hill, I descended the hill rolling. Okay? Um, so the fact that you can say, I ran around the corner, is actually supported by a lot of other things in the language. It's supported by the way in which prepositions are used, the way in which past prepositions are used. Um, uh, okay, here are a couple of examples where you cannot say this. Um, Fr I think Japanese works the same as French. Um, it, even such a simple thing like this, he ran into the house. You can't actually say that in French, using the verb to run. It, in other words, you cannot... If you were to translate it word for word, it would mean he ran around inside the house. To get the idea of running into the house, you would have to say, well, he entered the house running. Right? Uh, okay, we needn't bother with that. Okay. Um, and another example from, which I got from an Italian colleague. He lives over the hill, he lives beyond the hill, is unproblematic. But if you want to say, he walked over the hill, you can't say it. Well, you have to say he crossed the hill. He traversed the hill running or walking or whatever. Okay. Um, that then is a sort of illustration of um, a very small illustration of the way in which things are all sorts of interrelated and the set of things in the language is structured. In other words, the fact that you can say in English, he ran round the corner, meaning this. Okay, that is a sort of fact about English, but it's related, it is supported by all sorts of other facts about English. By the fact that you can use these prepositional phrases to refer to paths, um, in association with a verb of motion. Okay, so um, everything sort of hangs together. Um, and say so one consequence of this, uh, a pleasing consequence of this, would be that of the tens and hundreds of thousands of things that you have to learn when learning a language, they are not unrelated. In fact, they are related in all sorts of multiple ways um, and they support each other so in a way the more you know the easier it is to learn further because everything then has its place within, within the system so to speak um, and this I think offers a, I say, a somewhat different perspective on um, the notion of a rule right? um, what you have is simply 
a large network of these similarities, relations, schemas, and so on. So an expression like, you know, ran round the corner would be supported by the schema for prepositional phrases, for path expressions, and, and, and so on and so forth. And the fact that you can also say he lives round the corner would be supported by the fact that you can use other path prepositions in a similar way. You know, he lives over the hill, across the river, down the streets. He lives past the post office, and so on and so forth. Okay, now, <clears throat> I have another example of this, which possibly, yeah, things are, is another idiom I want to talk about, bang goes my weekend, which I mentioned this morning, which is actually another rather nice illustration of the way in which things are hanging together and are supported. Um, but maybe actually I'll, I'll delay that to another occasion, for another occasion. Um, so we promised we would have some questions and general discussion. So maybe we'll sort of stop for about five minutes or so while you get your ideas together. And then we'll, um, if you have any questions for topics for discussion, we'll... Um, do our best, okay?